Uh, good afternoon uh, from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, welcome to our group in the room and those of you watching virtually on Zoom. Uh, I'm Steve Ratner, I'm a professor at the law school and I have the honor of being the director of the Donia Human Rights Center at the University of Michigan. Uh, we're delighted to have all of you here today for our annual Martin Luther King lecture, the fourth lecture we've had at the Donia Human Rights Center in that series, uh, featuring Professor Mikhail Mutua of uh, SUNY Buffalo. Uh, with commentary by Professor Christina Dagirdas of the University of Michigan Law School. Um, we'll be handling the, uh, the Q&A through the, uh, for those of you on Zoom, through a method that uh, Professor Dagirdas will explain momentarily. Uh, so there will be a chance for those of you who are watching virtually to participate. Um, I'd like to hand uh, the floor over to Professor Dagirdas, who is a professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School and also the Associate Dean at the University of Michigan Law School. She teaches international law, with a specialty in international organizations, uh, such as the United Nations and other institutions. Uh, she's also a member of the State Department's Advisory Committee on International Law. And I'm delighted to turn the floor over to Professor Dagirdas. Thank you so much. It is a great pleasure to welcome Professor Mikhail Mutua back to the University of Michigan. He is a SUNY Distinguished Professor and the Margaret W. Wong Professor at the University of Buffalo School of Law, where he recently served as Dean for seven years from 2018 to 2014. He teaches international human rights, international business transactions, and international law. Professor Mutua was educated at the University of Nairobi, the University of Dar es Salaam, and Harvard Law School. He is a vice president of the American Society of International Law and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's the author of several books and numerous articles that are informed by many human rights, diplomatic, and rule of law missions to countries in Africa, Latin America, and Europe. In 2002 and 2003, while on sabbatical in Kenya, Professor Mutua chaired the task force on the establishment of a Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation Commission which he recommended a truth commission for Kenya. He was also a delegate to the National Constitutional Conference, which produced a contested draft constitution. I'm very much looking forward to today's lecture, which, as Professor Ratner mentioned, is part of the Donia Human Rights Center's annual Martin Luther King Jr. lecture series. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Gordes. Um, I would like, first of all, to begin by uh, recognizing the donors who have funded this program. Uh, thank you so much. I'm honored that you could be here to, to hear my lecture. Um, I also want to thank Professor Steve Ratner, the director of the center itself. Um, Professor Ratner is uh, one of the premier international legal scholars uh, of our time, and I'm honored uh, to have been asked by him uh, to come here today to give this signature lecture uh, honoring the, the Reverend uh, Martin Luther King, Jr. Um, I'd also like to thank Amanda and the staff of the center for their hospitality. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to um, <clears throat> say a few things, permit me if you will, to make two overarching sort of statements. The first is that uh, the Human rights is not a religion. And as such, I don't think that we are uh, co committed uh, or required to believe in it without question or dissent. Um, and I say this because a university um, and a human rights program at a university uh, is not a church. Uh, and as such, uh, I think we should feel free uh, to let our minds ask questions and debate the important issues regarding human rights. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that um, any social, political, moral, or economic idea that claims universality must be treated with a measure of skepticism. And that's because um, claims of universality or necessity seek to flatten the earth. Excuse my hyperbole there. Um, and in many cases to reject different forms of uh, difference. 
and to, to seek to change or even to wipe out conflicting and contesting ideas. And so for human rights, I think we should understand them in, this, in, in that context, uh, in, in, you know, as, as, uh, as my lecture proceeds. And I say these things to you because I do not like to hide the ball. I, I want to level with you so that you know what's coming at you. Um, so today I want to talk about arguably the most influential uh, legal, political, social idea of the last 100 years, and that's the human rights idea. And I do so to honor the life of the Reverend Martin Luther King, for whom this lecture has been named. And I want to say to you that um, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was the most significant human rights champion and defender of the last century, the 20th century. I know that we tend to think of him as, as, a, as, a, as a, simply as an American civil rights icon. But I believe that framing him as an American civil rights icon diminishes his global stature um, and his example to oppress people everywhere and also the deep impact of his theory of change or social change and what it really means or should mean to be truly free as human beings. Because you see the language of civil rights is a narrow language which is uniquely American. But the language of human rights is a more global language, is an encompassing language, and it's a language that, if you will, is much more totalizing in its deployment in the struggle for social change and social justice. I want to recall um, Dr. King's have been to the mountaintop speech, just a paragraph of that speech. Uh, on April 3rd, 1968, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. spoke at the Mason Temple Church in Memphis, Tennessee. That is the day before an assassin bullet um, failed him to the ground. He spoke at a time of great tumult in American history, at the height of the civil rights movement, as Americans of African descent pressed for equal rights in the political and economic system. But on this occasion, his speech was on the concerns of the striking sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King called for unity, for economic action, for boycotts, and for nonviolent protest, while challenging the United States to live up to its ideals of liberalism and democracy. At the end of his speech, uh, the, the Reverend discusses the possibility of his own untimely death as African Americans sought social justice and full citizenship in America. I like to quote the most memorable passage of what came to be known as the Abin to the mountaintop speech. He said, and I quote him, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter to me now because I have been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know that tonight, that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. He concluded by saying that my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. What was the mountain top that Dr. King saw? Is that the same mountain top that the human rights idea sees? Is it an attainable pinnacle of human civilization? Or is it a mirage? And why do I quote this paragraph? It's because in it, the Reverend King, the optimist, the human rights champion, allows himself a moment of hope, but also a moment of optimism. And for me, that is the essence of the human rights idea, an essence that it shares 
with liberalism and political democracy. These are ideas and ideals of great bursts of hope and change, but also of many setbacks and shortcomings. At their best, liberalism, democracy, and human rights, a trinity that is normatively organic, stand between power and powerlessness and put their thumb on the scale on behalf of the powerless and not the powerful. They stand at the intersection of power and powerlessness on the side of those who are powerless at their best. That's why in his famous speech, Dr. King wasn't talk just talking about civil or political rights. He was talking about economic and social rights without which full liberation is not possible. That is what Malcolm X, his contemporary, was focused on, not just civil and political rights, but economic power as well. In this, the two uh, key African-American leaders were in convergence, but I'll say more about this later. But let's admit upfront that human rights is an idea that without doubt has transformed the world and the way in which we think about, construct, and reconstruct societies and states around the globe. I think that's undeniable. But the human rights idea, great as it is, is not without controversy. And so therefore, I want to talk about the human rights idea and the movement in three stanzas. The first is a story of hope, the second is a story of despair, and the last is a story of my hope about human rights. Hope, despair, and my hope about human rights. And all of these three stanzas speak to the nature of one of the greatest struggles for the liberation of humankind from the tyranny of the state, the society, the community, and the individual. The stanzas tell us what is possible and what is not, and why, and whether we can do anything about it. It's why Dr. King progressively moved to the left of the political spectrum, to demand economic and social justice for African Americans and others in the project of American democracy. Now, in the last half of the last century, the 20th century, after World War II, that period was undoubtedly the golden era of the human rights movement. No less an authority than Professor Lewis Henkin, the late Professor Lewis Henkin of Columbia University, uh, one of the intellectual uh, fathers, if you will, of the modern human rights movement, dubbed this period the age of rights. He wrote, and I quote, that human rights is the idea of our time, the only political moral idea that has received universal acceptance. Professor Philip Austin, a leading contemporary and scholar of human rights, has argued that naming a claim a human right elevates it above the rank and file of competing societal goals and bestows upon it an aura of timelessness of absoluteness and of universal validity. Now, these are obviously very strong claims. Um, they, are a, they are grandiose, in fact, statements, if I may say so, made by insiders, individuals who have an interest, obviously, in depicting human rights as the zenith of human civilization. What is not in doubt is a cascade of norms processes and institutions propagating human rights since World War II. These mushroomed everywhere at the universal, regional, and national levels, even in states where the genre of rights was not indigenous to the nat native tongue. The United Nations became the global champion of the human rights crusade around the world. And I use the word crusade advisedly. Within states, National constitutions increasingly took the normative content of the, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the other key international human rights texts. Now, seen from this perspective, it is difficult to argue that the human rights idea 
was not phenomenally successful. But it would be foolish to pretend without any qualification that the 20th century was indeed the human rights epoch. Even as the seeds and sinews of human rights were planted worldwide, the last half of the century proved to be one of the most brutal eras of our time. Genocides were committed with, uh, in many countries, uh, including in Cambodia, in Yugoslavia, in Iraq, in China, in Rwanda, and Uganda. Unspeakable crimes were carried out in many other countries, including Argentina, Chile, and South Africa. As the century closed, the international community adopted the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the first permanent tribunal designed to bring to account perpetrators of the most heinous crimes, no matter how high their stations in government or society. But by the end of the century, much of the enthusiasm that had characterized the surge of the human rights movement since the 1970s had cooled down. Human rights seemed to have failed to deliver a utopian world. In fact, the first decade, uh, or the first two decades of, of uh, the 21st century brought several dystopian catastrophes. The ugly American-led wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The savage Saudi-led killings in Yemen. The descent into untold brutalities in the Congo uh, and the Sudan. And the slaughter of hundreds of thousands in Syria. And while the language of human rights had become ubiquitous, its power to mobilize outrage and action seemed to fade. And I think part of the problem was what I've uh, termed um, the, the, the problem of the deficits uh, of human rights. Now, creeds and ideologies that overpromise inevitably um, underperform, and they are destined to suffer public fatigue. And I'm sorry to say that human rights is one such ideology. And I call it an ideology because it's a moral, legal, political, and economic schema. It is moral because it propagates a set of beliefs that assume the innate nature of humans. Even if human rights are skeptical about the innate goodness of the human being, they assume that our worst proclivities will give way to our better angels if we live in a particular civilizational order. And so therefore there has been this, what I've called a messianic germ in human rights. Its chief authors and, and proponents, depicted in almost biblical spiritual terms, uh, Henry Steiner, Professor Henry Steiner and Professor Austin, uh, quoted earlier, for example, have referred to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as the parent document, the initial burst of idealism and enthusiasm, terser, more general and grander than the treaties, in some sense, the constitution of the entire movement. Uh, Professor Marianne Glendon of Harvard Law School went even further and argued that the UDHR is already showing signs of having achieved the status of holy writ. Now, these views have been widely shared within the human rights movement, particularly in international non-governmental organizations based in the Western world. Within these circles and the foreign policy est establishments of the West, a fundamental belief in human rights as a matter of policy has become an article of faith. Western human rights scholars and advocates, uh, and we have some of them in the room today, and I hope I'm, uh, I'm not name calling anyone, uh, they are all my friends, uh, scholars and, and advocates, and their acolytes in the global south have been akin to acquire in the church. The advocacy and defense of human rights are done with a religious zeal. The reason is that human rights have become the moral argument, in my view, for the liberal project. It's an ideology that refines and culminates in political democracy, the rule of law, and individual rights, constitutionalism, and free markets. And all of those are part and parcel of what I've called the human rights schema. In fact, Thomas Frank, uh, Professor Thomas Frank argued forcefully that human rights are universal and require a Western-style democracy for their achievement. Uh, 
These scholars have contended that going back to John Locke, the West was able to discover the genius for the good society by actualizing the liberal project. They have regarded many critiques of human rights as a project as heresy. But even so, the human rights idea has failed to gain complete submission in cultures and traditions outside the West, especially in Asia, in the Muslim world, and to a lesser extent in Africa. Thus, these deficits of human rights, the cultural deficits, the democratic deficits, and the ideological deficits, point to either an incompleteness of the project or a crisis in the movement. It is these deficits that raise the question, in my view, about the end of the, the human rights era. Critics have argued that the human rights movement is an attempt to universalize Western liberalism through its globalization. It's true that leading human rights uh, scholars, such as Professor Antonio Cassese and Professor Virginia Leary of my own law school, categorically stated that the West imposed, imposed its philosophy of human rights on the rest of the world because it controlled the United Nations in 1948. The charge that the human rights corpus is not universal because of its Eurocentric origins and biases is perhaps the most poignant critique of the human rights movement. This argument springs from the fact that the original drafters of the UDHR, the Universal Declaration, and the initial basic texts were either Westerners or individuals who were either educated in the West or steeped in its traditions. This is how the early formulation and codification of human rights standards, whose legacy is a signature corpus, were dominated by Western cultural norms and political ideas. But should we throw the baby out with the bath water because of its origins? We must remember, however, that largely absent were African, Asian, Muslim, Hindu, and other traditions. My view is that this failure of multiculturalism at the start of the movement remains one of, the, one of its most troubling drawbacks. Attempts have been made uh, to export human rights to the global south through the UN and through foreign policies of the, uh, the most powerful industrial democracies of the West. These attempts have given credence to the view that human rights is a part of a historical continuum of the civilizing mission of Eurocentrism. The fact that the major international human rights organizations such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and others are located in the West has not helped this situation. And the fact that they have also, those organizations, traditionally focused their work historically focused their work on the global south uh, uh, as uh, added to the view that the human rights project is a neo-colonialist endeavor. Furthermore, the rhetoric of imperial states, um, when they have gone to war with other countries, have often been couched, has often been couched and justified on human rights grounds. This again is a troubling association between imperial projects and human rights. The presentation, I think, of uh, human rights as a gift of the West to the rest of the world gives the impression that the, the rest of the world has nothing to offer in a discussion about the construction of a corpus of human dignity. I think it was my friend, the late Professor Lewis Hankin, who said that uh, human rights is a gift of the West to the rest. Um, critics also argue that the human rights corpus is too limited in the scope of the rights it, con it considers important. Historically and programmatically, the movement has emphasized on traditional and civil rights, 
uh, traditional civil and political rights, entitlements that are uh, paradigmatic uh, of a Western liberal democracy. Um, in contrast, I would say, no serious attention has really been paid to economic, social, and cultural rights or to the Second Covenant, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Uh, and I think some of these problems are a legacy of the Cold War. Uh, due to this uh, blind spot, I think for a long time the human rights movement was viewed with a lot of skepticism in the global south, where economic privation and poverty are major challenges. And those particular doubts have not been erased. Uh, political despotism is a problem that must be addressed. But so are the ravages of economic liberalization, of globalization, of economic ex exploitation, and of marginalization. Skeptics have argued that individualism, individualism, the runaway individual egoist, that ought not to be the overriding genetic fingerprint of the human rights corpus. The failure of the movement to treat seriously, either normatively or in terms of its work, group and community rights has detracted from its cultural legitimacy in many societies in the global south. The reluctance of states, for example, to protect the environment uh, or to preserve the rights of minorities and in indigenous communities is blamed on the unremitting push for free markets and the individual egoist who does not shoulder any social responsibility. So there's need to balance the rights of the individual and those of the community because group membership is usually the occasion for human rights violations. However, Western human rights thinkers and activists label those who seek the use of culture to reconstruct the human rights corpus as cultural relativists, which is a form of name calling by which they mean these are apologists for terrible third world states and terrible uh, 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 cultural practices in the global south. It should be clear, however, to all of us, and especially to thinkers like us, that the legitimacy of human rights is only possible if communities around the world see their identity in it, see themselves in it. Otherwise, human rights will remain a Western export without deep roots in other societies. Now, I just, I, I talked a little bit about universality, but let me talk a little bit about hypocrisy. Um, the, the most damning charge, uh, I think, of the human rights uh, text has been its sort of European Western pandage and normative basis. Now, progress has been made to address this deficit, I want to say. Um, many of the challenges that it raises, however, have not been fully answered. Uh, the human rights movement remains largely a cultural possession of the West, in spite of the language, the adoption of, the, the adoption of its language as material for combating political despotism by activists around the globe, especially in the global south. Um, so the failure of the movement, I think, to blunt, to effectively blunt the charge of normative, philosophical, and cultural exclusivity has contributed to this, to, to the decline. I think while many countries in the world have accepted uh, uh, free market economies and varying degrees of political liberalization, they still have not, in their cultures, fully embraced the two key tenets of the human rights movement. Um, these are um, uh, abstract, abstract equality um, and, and um, um, it, I mean, these, these, these are under discrimination, so these are under, disc, under discrimination norms and equal protection uh, tenets which lie at the heart of the movement. Um, the universality of human rights has also been undermined by double standards. Um, what 
some of us see as hypocrisy of many in the West. The West has, of course, been accused of being guilty of perpetuating some of the same abuses uh, at home as well as abroad. Um, while the West has been very busy uh, calling others you know, to account for those same abuses that it has perpetuated. Uh, as you know, during much of the Cold War, the West coddled many right-wing fascist dictatorships across the globe, even as it condemned the excesses of the Soviet bloc, China, and other communist states. There have been no serious attempts, in my view, that I have seen by Western governments and intellectuals to seriously grapple with and excavate points of convergence between human rights norms, which are essentially of Eurocentric origin, and other languages of human dignity from the global south. Other languages of human dignity from the global south. Don't forget that human rights is just one language of human dignity. There are other languages of human dignity that I think um, could, could, could cross-fertilize and could create uh, um, you know, a common ground. The bridges that have been built to find a more universal human rights language have come primarily from the advocates and intellectuals in the global south. I would say that many of, many of my colleagues uh, in the West are very inflexible on this point, very inflexible on this point. Um, even the way they treat the African human rights system, which I think is one of those systems that has made some useful contribution uh, to, a, to, to a normative, a normative uh, uh, discourse um, to expand the, 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 the universality of the corpus itself. Now, without a doubt, the, human rights, the African human rights system has some problems. Uh, but I think the contributions, the intellectual contributions of the, of the African the Charter, for example, uh, cannot be gainsaid. They ex it, it expands the normative reach of the human rights corpus beyond its narrow European uh, moors. Um, the cultural attacks on human rights, uh, both by well-meaning uh, folks, by those, some of those who believe in human dignity, but also by manipulative and hypocritical leaders in the global south, have also done much to create damage uh, to the project of universality. The cultural terrain has been contested fiercely by protagonists on both sides. Religion has been used as a trump to chip away at the legitimacy of the human rights movement. Um, now, what do we see uh, when we look at the rear view mirror uh, of the human rights movement? And I say the rear view mirror of the human rights movement not because I don't want to say definitively that the era of human rights is over. I'm not quite sure about that. But I can start to see the rear view mirror of the human rights movement, unless something dramatic happens. As we look back, in the rear view mirror, or what is turning out to be the rear view mirror. Thinkers will have to contend with the fact that this great idea uh, may have come and gone. But I want to say that the seeds that were planted by the human rights movement and the triumphalism of the human rights movement because of those seeds has not ended. The end of the era, if in fact it is that, does not necessarily, in my view, signify the complete impotence of human rights norms and values. I think the internationalization and the universalization of human rights principles and tenets is deeply embedded in the psyches of states and even in some cultures, so that that embeddedness uh, will be difficult to reverse. Perhaps we can build on it, but it will be very difficult to reverse. The triumph, for example, of the liberal constitution 
the liberal constitution, the one indisputable evidence of the ubiquity of the human rights uh, movement cannot be gainsaid. Concepts of constitutionalism and individual rights which underpin the modern state are not going away. These are huge contributions so that even those of us who dispute the messianic view of human rights do not dispute some of these points. We just think that, that the normative band is too narrow and the focus is also too narrow. Because it is the deficit, in my view, the failure of the movement to change the abusive proclivities of the state, of society, and the individual. That, that's been its pain. The movement of a promised, it promised a utopia, but has left in place a dystopia. That's why I want to think that the end of the human rights era, if in fact that's what it is, will have left us with a moral vacuum. A moral vacuum without anything else to replace it. What's to be done? What is to be done? First, I think we need uh, a measure of humility especially from the West, to admit that we in the West and others who teach and practice human rights, to admit that we are not found the genius or the perfect society, and to admit that this is not the gift of the West to the rest. We saw what happened in 2016 with the election of Donald Trump. We saw the emergence of fascism and the rejection of democracy and liberalism by huge demographics in the United States. We are still reeling from that phenomenon. Is the problem simply one of the resurgence in the open of America's original sin, of racism, and of the subjugation of black people and people of color, or is it deeper? Is it a failure of democracy and the human rights idea? If so, we're building on the greed values of human rights, because there are some agreed values of human rights, but buttressing them with notions of substantive equality and a social justice and social democratic agenda be a solution. Remember the human rights corpus is premised on the norms of abstract equality and um, the notion that individuals in themselves are autonomous, individual autonomy, abstract equality and individual autonomy. Those are the two pillars of the human rights movement. How do we build on those two pillars, formal equality and abstract autonomy? How do we build on those two pillars? And instead of, um, you know, instead of simply stopping there, which is, which is, I think, where we have stopped, how do we go further from those two pillars? Do we need to, to, do we need to like, recalibrate and stop treating the containment of polit political despotism as a panacea for all social ills? And focus equally on what I've called um, economic despotism and the suffering wrought by markets. What kind of society permits the emergence of a Bill Gates or a George Bezos? 
What kind of society does that? What kind of a society in which 40% of the wealth is in the hands of 20 people? I'll tell you what kind of society that is. That's an immoral society. Okay. And that is something that we have to correct. Do we need to go back to the drawing board and stop holding on to totems of human rights that are per se? And I've lost popular purchase, such as, for example, the pairing of human rights and markets. Should perhaps human rights take a step back from the concept of quote unquote free markets? Is the answer in combining the teachings of the Reverend Martin Luther King and those of Malcolm X and other critical thinkers? to expand the normative reach of liberalism. I want to end by going back to the Reverend Martin Luther King. What would the Reverend Martin Luther King see today if he came back to earth? And what, was he, what would he say to us? Remember his speech. I have been to the mountaintop. What was that mountaintop that he was talking about? What would he see today? I'll tell you what he'll see today. One of the things that he'll see today is the attack on critical race theory. That's one of the things that he would see. Because, you know, the Reverend Mark, Dr. Martin Luther King was uh, perhaps the first critical race theorist. Because critical race theory is a metaphor for the struggle of social justice. Not just in this country, but in all over the globe. It's Attacks on critical race theory, in my view, deny, seek to deny the existence of historical injustices. They seek to deny accountability, more importantly for those historical injustices. They seek to deny historical truth that seeks or calls for introspection and the national catharsis to course correct on America's original sin. Martin Luther King would see that the horrible conditions of the sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968 are still, are still there today 54 years later, in Detroit, in Chicago, in Buffalo, in New York City, and in all our communities and cities across this nation. And he would say, in my view, that we have not reached the mountaintop. I thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Matua, for this, um, this wonderful and this provocative uh, lecture. I, I appreciate your, your introductory comment that, that human rights is not a religion and universities are not churches. I think for those of us who's are, who are scholars, we choose our topics of interest in part because of a sense that, well, this is something important and worth right, devoting all of this energy and attention to. And it's, it's so crucial, as you said, to be conscious of the risk that in that judgment, we are bringing rose-colored glasses to the subject that we choose. I think the criticisms that you make about the, the lack of multiculturalism in the origin of modern human rights 
really land. And in thinking about what an effective rebuttal might look like, it strikes me that I agree with you entirely that it would not be anything that any Western government official might say, nothing that somebody who works for Amnesty International might say. I think the most effective rebuttal would have to come from vulnerable communities in states around the entire world that have found the invocation of universal human rights a useful tool for advancing their cause. So I think the idea that human rights might achieve utopia was always an, an overpromise. But the idea that by cloaking certain claims in universal language, that they do, right, that they are elevated. There's a claim that a uh, demand for equality is not a it's not an idiosyncratic taste, like somebody might have a preference for strawberry ice cream <laughs> over uh, a different flavor, right? There's a claim and a reinforcement that comes from universality. And so I'm thinking that the rebuttal to what you see would come from uh, organization, black organizations in Argentina fighting for racial justice, incorporating the language of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into their own organizations charters. I think it would come from indigenous groups who find that invoking the language of human rights and sometimes even the processes in the courts that are established by human rights machinery, a useful tool to counter their own governments. I think looking around the world, it, it, would, it would be a big project to build up a, a bottom-up case for human rights, but it seems to me that that would be that would be the, the rebuttal of the claim, right? The way to move past that origin is a convincing demonstration um, of the ways in which vulnerable communities have found mm -hmm. human rights language and the, re the reinforcement that comes from a claim to universality um, might help us, <laughs> right? To, to rebut that, um, the, the charge of the origin and to move forward. And so before we move to comments from the whole group, I would love to hear more. Your work is informed by on-the-ground missions in Africa, in Latin America, in Europe. Um, and I wonder, when you, when you reflect on what, the, what you saw through those missions, um, does that give you a different perspective <laughs> uh, or, or a complication to your story? Or maybe just a clear image of what the seeds you mentioned might sprout into as we think about what a more genuinely uh, universal human rights might look like in the future. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Dean. I think that, um, um, you know, it's difficult for anyone to argue that uh, a corpus of universal human rights is not possible. It's very difficult to argue that. Uh, because human beings have certain needs, which are basic. Uh, however, I think what the problem has been, and what I think um, uh, our friends uh, who control the human rights movement um, have, had a, have had trouble with, and this includes people like ourselves who are academics, uh, is really, um, a failure to understand that there are different languages of human dignity and that human rights is just one such language. Uh, it's, it's one such language whose origin is in Europe. The language of rights uh, was never universal in the first place. Uh, many communities have a language of duty as opposed to languages of right. Uh, others have languages of uh, hospitality. You know, there are many, many languages that, that are spoken uh, that seek to give, you know, wholesomeness or to fulfill the potential of the human person out there. And I think it is those languages that have not been excavated. Um, and so I, you know, you asked about my work um, because I combine both my scholarly work, but also um, I'm, I'm the founding chairman of uh, the Kenya Human Rights Commission, or chairperson of the Kenya Human Rights Commission, which is 
the largest and most influential human rights NGO in Kenya. Um, you know, and initially, I think when we founded that organization, we, we, we copied and pasted uh, the, the mission statements of, of, of uh, Amnesty International and, and Human Rights Watch. But as time went on, we realized that our people in Kenya were not interested simply in, 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 in um, discussions about police brutality, simply about due process, simply about uh, you know, violence generally. They were also in, they're interested in those things for sure. And, and, and questions of the ballot. You know, who are we gonna elect in the next election? You know, as a way of influencing policy. People came to us and wanted to talk to us about basic, um, you know, kitchen table issues. Where am I gonna get my food? Where are my kids gonna go to school? You know, um, where am I gonna get my, my health care? So these are issues that were front and center of people's minds. And you know, when we, when we looked at our older sort of uh, brothers and sister organizations in the West, we did not see uh, an, an engagement with those issues of economic, social, and cultural rights. We did not see that. And in fact, as you know very well, it was not until the 1990s that Amnesty International began to address those issues, that Human Rights Watch began to address those issues. And I think they, addressed, they began to address those issues because they felt the push, the push back, I should say, from uh, uh, human rights groups in the global south. You know, the other question really that I talked about here was, um, you know, uh, if you've done missions uh, to, to some of these countries, you realize that group rights are very important. You know, you realize that people want to protect the earth. You know, they want to protect their water streams. They want to protect their environment. Okay, and these are issues that were not talked about. Um, the, the, um, there, there's, uh, there's, um, there's one right that was developed uh, in, in the UN system, the right to development. Okay, for me, that uh, the failure of our brothers and sisters in the West to engage on that right to development uh, remains to me one of the worst uh, sort of uh, derelictions of duty by academics and activists. You know? The right is there, but no one knows what it means. No one knows how it can be, it can be, it can be actualized. You know, people, a lot of uh, academics and, 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 and uh, activists talk about it in the global south, okay? And their voice certainly is important. But we know that there's a skewed um, sort of um, geopolitical system. And in that skewed geopolitical system, we need people at the University of Michigan to speak so that the West can hear them. We need uh, you, Dean, to speak up. We need uh, Professor Ratner to speak up, to write about it so that this can be heard. So that is a synergy that I was talking about that I think it's important. Okay, thank you. So I have um, some questions that have already come in online. For those of you who are watching from Zoom, please use the Q&A feature rather than the chat to raise your questions. Um, those of you in the audience can, of course, raise your hands. And I just ask that you identify yourself and your institutional affiliation before you ask the question. I would like to start, um, Professor, with a question that came in online um, from an anonymous attendee, but it follows um, quite nicely on your comment on the right to development and some of what you said. Uh, so the question is, does the recent adoption of the right to a healthy environment help change the narrative of human rights to be more inclusive? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, I think that the right to health itself is not um, a mystery, okay? I think it is, uh, even, even in the West, it's, uh, you know, the campaign by uh, candidate Bernie Sanders, uh, you know, propelled him to the top ranks of, of you know, of the, of, of the race because he talked about these issues. He talked about actually economic and social rights questions, you know, education and health and so on. So I think that's, 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 uh, that is not news to me. Uh, what is news to me is that, um, you know, there is now a push to adopt a, a universal document on health itself. 
which I think is so important because, and now we are talking, of course, about health in the context uh, of uh, COVID. Okay, and you've seen what has happened. You know, um, you've seen all the vaccines. Uh, you know, go to people in the West and in, and to rich countries uh, in the global South. Um, you've seen, um, you know, um, the prevalence of of uh, the virus uh, become unknown in Africa because no one is really doing research on what is going on with Omicron. People do not know how many people have died. People do not know how many people have got it and so on and so forth. You know, that is like a forgotten continent, you know, when it, came, when it, when it, came, when it comes to disease. Malaria, for example, you know, still kills tons and tons of people in Africa. Typhoid, you know, th diseases that are not known elsewhere. You know, and so I just want to say that, uh, that, uh, that if, you know, if, 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 if we have learned anything uh, f from the questioners, um, you know, uh, from the query from the questioner, is that simply that, you know, COVID has taught us the necessity of perhaps a charter you know, if you will, uh, you know, on, 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 on health. And, and I think that, that that's a good idea um, because I think people, as you said correctly, people in the global south are the ones who wear this shoe and they know why it pinches. Uh, and so they have to come to the table and uh, advance this conversation. Okay, yes. Just a bit, just a bit um, first of all, thank you very much for this very uh, powerful and challenging talk. Yes. Uh, there's a couple of ways to respond to what you're saying, I think, but I would like to focus on a document that you mentioned but don't seem to take very seriously, which mm. I consider to be one of the great human rights documents of the 20th century, and more importantly, the next human rights document, and that's the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Mm -hmm. You know that document as well as I do. It talks about people's rights, it talks about environmental rights, it talks about children's rights, it talks about responsibilities, and and it focuses on economic and social rights, too. Mm -hmm. I think that that's what's happening right now. And I think our interlocutor pointed that out, too. There's, you could talk about the environmental rights movement, mm -hmm. which I've been part of, and which just John Knox was just here a couple months ago, uh, to celebrate its naming mm -hmm. as, as a real human right. Mm -hmm. um, I, could, I could point to incredible human rights movements in, in all around the world, including in Africa, led by children, about children's rights. Mm -hmm. um, Black Lives Matter movement in this country mm -hmm. is absolutely a group rights movement. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it so objectionable to so many people. Mm -hmm. So I think that the language of human rights is, has an appeal that, that you don't want to see, that I think a lot of people around the world are seeing, mm -hmm. and they are embracing. Mm -hmm. um, the former director, uh, Kiyo Tsutsui, his book on, uh, which, I'm sh which I'm sure you know, about mm. Japanese human rights, mm. uh, shows how much the language of human rights can be used mm. when we're talking about indigenous people as well. Mm. So mm. how do you see mm. something mm. like the African Charter and mm. its, I think, growing impact in that area? You know, mm. activism? Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, no I, I want to thank you for that question uh, that is engaging. Um, I, I think I try to uh, sort of split the baby, if you will, if you'll excuse the language, uh, because we want our babies to live. But we try, I try to split that baby to say that, um, you know, I remember very well when I went to law school in the 80s uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I remember, you know, I was one of the first people to take um, the human rights class there that was offered by Professor Henry Steiner. And there are only 15 of us in the classroom, okay? Do you know that I went to teach there as a visiting professor in, uh, in the 90s? And do you know that my class was oversubscribed? That's how popular, you know, the idea had become, okay? I also remember how many students I taught at Buffalo uh, in 96 in the human rights class. There were very many. I remember, I know how many students I teach today in the human rights class. There are very few, okay? That, that may not be scientific, but I think it just tells you that, that the language of, of, of rights is not, the language of human rights is not as captivating as it once was. Uh, 
And I think we would make a mistake to sort of brush this, this lack of enthusiasm for human rights uh, away. I agree with you that that struggle has mutated into other fields, uh, into other arenas. We don't call it human rights, for example. We don't call it that. You know that. You know, so for example, the Black Lives Matter movement, they are not using the language of human rights per se. They are using the norms, but not the language of human rights per se. Okay, that is one way, I think, to energize the conversation. Um, for, the, for, the, um, for the African Charter, I, I, uh, I agree with you completely. Okay? I only have some issues with it, uh, and, and I'm sure you have the same issues with it, uh, with the clobber clauses, for example, you know, that are terrible, where you know, language you know, is written in such a way that you are given a right with one hand, and then it is taken you know, with the other. You know, that's a drafting question because the states that approved that charter, as you know very well, in, 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 19, in the 1980s, were undemocratic states. And so they give us this beautiful charter in, 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 uh, you know, on some normative issues, but then they make it very impossible for you to implement it, to actualize it. Okay? And you know the African Commission has gone back and tried to interpret some of those sections to destroy uh, those limitations that were put there. So for example, you, know, you, 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 you have the right to information uh, as long as you act within the law, okay? As long as you act within the law. So the law can be very undemocratic, right? And repressive. So the, so the African Commission said that within the law means that that law must be just, okay? And democratic. You know, so they have, they have kind of in a sneaky way, um, as, 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 uh, as creative lawyers often do, you know, done that. So, so I don't disagree with you completely, but I would caution against, um, uh, you know, a, a kind of um, uh, a lackadaisical approach to the view that the power to mobilize outrage by the human rights language is not there anymore, per se that there's a vacuum there. But look at Syria. I mean, look at the Congo. Look at Yemen today. Who is talking about Yemen? The Saudis are bombing Yemen back to the Stone Age. You know, have you seen any complaints from anyone? Maybe once in a while. If it was in the 90s, there will be hell to pay. But there's not today. Okay, so our next question is coming. Um, from a Zoom participant, Abdelwase Ansari, who is a PhD student here at the U of M philosophy department. Uh, so the question, would it be easier to respect some of the concerns about the ineptitude of rights language and to capture some of the cultural contingent, contingency at the level of conceiving human dignity, to switch to the language of fundamental human capabilities and objective interests? as opposed to a human rights framework? Yeah. Yeah, this is a question that I always get. You know, what language are we gonna use uh, to, make, to make things stick or to make things have purchase? Maybe not stick, but have purchase. The, the question of uh, the medium of rights um, is obligatory, okay? And, you know, and this is why, so for example, people, people always confuse you know, human rights uh, advocates with lawyers. But they are not, a lot of human rights people are not lawyers. You know, but they deploy this language of rights to do what they do. The reason is that uh, in a rights-based society where legislation matters, where you lobby states, in the construction of the modern state, you know, with the executive, the legislature, and, and uh, the judiciary uh, being the guardian of rights, this makes a lot of sense. You can actually, extract accountability from the state. Don't forget that the addressee is really the state. So you can extract accountability from the state. When, as, a, as a, the, uh, the emailer you know, uh, is asking, if you, if you put it to the language of capabilities, for example, and these are the languages, they'll be milly-mouthed, okay? And they'll be relegated, relegated to the area uh, or to the arena of policy, okay? And you know, policy is problematic. 
uh, because policy is not binding, policy can be changed, policy is not, is not, is not inflexible. Rights are inflexible for the most part. You know? And so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that, uh, but, but there's no need for us to think that, that it's a choice of either or. Okay? So I think that, for example, people have always uh, asked this question. You know, in Africa, you do not have, you know, in many places in Africa in the pre-colonial period, you do not have, you know, sort of modern legal regime. Okay, uh, in many societies, there are no courts. There, there are other other ways of sanctioning, uh, you know, bad conduct. Okay, but but those methods were there, you know, uh, through denunciation, you know, through uh, rejection and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, the, the use of moral tools, those things don't exist anymore in a modern state. You, you know, so you need, you need something with, with, uh, with a little bit of a, uh, a bite that can, that can cut to the bone. And the law is one of those things. So I don't know whether the, uh, perhaps uh, the colleague who is, who is asking the question might join me uh, so that we can think about uh, other equally effective methods beyond the law. You know, but don't forget, I should say this here. I should say that the human rights um, uh, corpus only works because societies and cultures submit themselves to it. That's the only reason they work. You know, I often tell my students, people do not listen to the Supreme Court simply because, because it has gone. Okay? They listen to the Supreme Court of the United States because it, it has, I hope it still does, uh, some moral authority in the population, some legitimacy in the population. If the Supreme Court lost legitimacy in the society, we would not listen to the Supreme Court, right? We would not do it. We would not listen to the courts. And there are many countries in the world where people don't listen to courts, many, because those courts have no legitimacy in their society. So legitimacy is very important. I don't want to dismiss the notion that, uh, that, that these other languages can be effective. You know, they can be effective, but people have got to submit themselves to those languages. Okay, so let me um, ask our 3D audience if they have questions. And in particular, um, I'd like to give the students in the audience uh, a priority when it comes to asking a question. Yes? Oh, just a moment, there's a, there's a microphone coming behind you. Uh, sir. I'm Kushal Bakshi. I'm a master's student at the law school um, at Michigan. So my question is that recently there's been sort of this move to include human rights language in business transactions of sorts. I'm talking about like the UN Global Compact or the Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of, I'm, I hope this push comes through, but there's a push to include like labor rights within the WTO mechanisms. I'm mm -hmm. curious what you think of that within the scale of the talk that you've just given. Yeah. Um... You know, so I, uh, you know, I, when you listen to me and you read my work, uh, you know, people will meet me, they say, oh, well, but you're such a nice guy. Um, but you write these horrible things, but you're such a nice fellow. Uh, but, you know, I always say that, um, well, first of all, I want to get your attention when I write. Otherwise, why would I write and you don't read what I write? But, but the second thing uh, is to say that I... Um, I think all of us as human beings understand instinctively that deep change does not come in a day. That change, deep change, is generally reformist. Okay? Even when you have a revolution, for example, you still have to do the change. You, know, you might have a, 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 a thoroughgoing social revolution that overthrows existing order. But then to institute a substitute for what was there is a very difficult process. And so, um, I, you know, I was always afraid to be very radical in my youth uh, for fear that in my old age I would become very conservative. And one of the things that I have come to learn from my own uh, uh, sort of statement is that the work of reform is very difficult. The work of change is very difficult. So I was one of the people who wrote a document for the, for the government of Canada uh, 
with a friend of mine called Robert House uh, on, um, on how um, you know, human rights could be used uh, to create more room uh, within the WTO system to tame the excesses of that system. You know, how we could use uh, customary international law to sort of get to that question. That is essentially a, remo a reformist argument, okay? But it's an argument that, for example, if we say that um, the WTO should allow NGOs in the room, for example, when they are discussing important questions, that may sound like a small thing, but it's very, very important because they will start participating in norm making within that system. You know, so um, so long as we live in a society that is based on the on the notion of contract right, in a free market system, so long as we live in that system. We have to respect this notion of reform, uh, no matter how gradual that system is. It does not matter that that does not mean that we should not push for change. As I said before, um, I went to the um, to the WTO meeting in Seattle in 1998. Some of you may remember that. I think Professor Ratna, you may remember that when there were demonstrations there and windows were broken, and people were dressed as, as turtles. Uh, because they were protesting the destruction of turtles, uh, turtles in, the, uh, in, in marine life. And as windows were being broken by uh, anti-globalization activists, I think myself and uh, Professor House, we were on the 20th floor addressing a meeting of uh, you know, government officials and uh, executives and so on about why human rights values were important for inclusion in the WTO system, about why, you know, Article 20 was important. You know Article 20 um, on exceptions, right? Um, on, on respecting the environment, respecting, you know, human values and so on and so forth. Why that article is a linchpin and why that article should be brought to life in the context of the WTO. We made that argument, and I told them as I was leaving that if they don't listen to us, they will have to listen to the people downstairs who are breaking windows. Okay, so there's a place for what for, for, for the question you are asking, and of course I under, I endorse it. Do we have any other questions from the in-person audience? Yes. Oh, hello, Professor. I'm an undergraduate student of U of M, majoring in history. I'd like to ask that, like, how do you distinguish the distinctive language and the violation of human rights? Like, uh, like in different countries, like they have different situations. How do you like um, define the the treatment of the government to their to their people? Are the violation of human rights or is it's another language of human rights that should be like uh, added into the corpus. Yes, yeah, um, I think I understand what you're asking. I, I just want to say that, um, you know, for example, um, if, if you pick out individual rights in, in the documents, for example, you know, free speech, uh, you know, uh, freedom from torture, due process protections, and so on, the right to movement, and so on, if you pick out all of these things, those things well, no one can argue with those things, right? Um, and so to the extent that governments use their power willy-nilly to run roughshod about all those things, those should be condemned for sure, okay? What I've said is that culture is the accumulation of a people's wisdom. Culture is the accumulation of a people's wisdom. Um, a people cannot exist without culture. Okay? And so to the extent that we understand that basic point, that we must accept almost um, as a matter of fact that every culture has a notion of human dignity. 
know, there, there, there might be some, some problems here and there. There is always in every culture a language of human dignity. Otherwise, these cultures will not self-perpetuate. Yeah. There are people who would vanish from the globe. So it is those notions that are important to me. Uh, so for example, um, if it's a question of free speech, for example, uh, if you know, I am not wedded to one form of protecting free speech. There are many forms of protecting free speech. You know, in the United States, you can say anything, almost, and get away with it. Okay, you know that. In Germany, you cannot talk. About, you you cannot uh, use um, race. Um, you know, uh, you cannot incite people based upon race, as you can do in the United States. You will go to jail in Germany. Okay. There's a divergence between the, the, the human rights corpus notion of free speech and American notions of free speech. Okay. There's actually a wide gap between those two. You know? So I'm not saying that every country should do what, um, you know, that, that there's a one size fits all. But I think there is the, uh, the ability to speak, to move around, to associate. All these are important factors in any society. What is the balance? The freedom of the individual versus the community. Where is the balance? You know, we must find a balance. You know, should we go to one extreme or the other? I don't think so. We must find that balance. Um, but, but to your question, I think it is, for example, in the global south or in Asia, for example, those societies must guide the globe uh, on how to find that balance. They must, you know, I think that. Um, you know, as I said uh, in my in my remarks here, um, I don't know whether whether you know uh, the dominant Chinese cultural forms can find themselves in the human rights corpus. I don't know. You know that's a conversation we must have. You know, and where there is a problem with that, then I think we have to find ways to uh, to accommodate those notions. Because if there are notions of human dignity, they must be accommodated. If there are, hu if there are notions of human dignity, they must be uh, uh, accommodated. I mean, so I, I just want to say this, uh, you know, in international law, we have the notion of preemptive norms, okay? Norms that are so important that they cannot be, uh, you know, breached under any circumstances, all right? They cannot be trumped by any other norm. So I believe that in human rights, there is that too. Okay, can we expand that list on the things that we can agree upon? Can we expand that list of things that are in essence untouchable, which describe human dignity, not just human rights, but human dignity? Can we expand that? So for example, why would a person ever starve to death because of lack of food? Have you thought about that? People are dying all the time because they don't have enough to eat. Why do we allow that? And why is that not prohibited? And the person responsible for that punished for it. Why not? Why not? It's because we think that poverty is a moral failing. That poverty is not a responsibility of the state. Well, I'll tell you something. Poverty is not a moral failing. It is a responsibility of the state. And the state ought to be accountable for poverty. Okay, thank you, Professor Matua, for this lecture, for this conversation, which I think is a really, there may be no better way to honor Reverend, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy. So thank you so much for being, with here, being here with us today. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Professor Matua.